Hi everyone, I hope this video finds you well. In this video, we're going to explore congressional midterm elections in a little bit of detail. Now, you might ask, why are we spending time looking at congressional elections in a course on the presidency? And the answer is that presidents cast a pretty long shadow over midterm elections, even though their name does not appear on any ballots in the midterms. So let's see what's going on here. First, just for clarity's sake, let's define what we're talking about when we say midterm elections. These are the elections that are held two years into a president's term, literally the middle of the president's term. So these elections are defined in relation to the presidency, even though the president is not up for election at this time. That kind of gives away the game as to why we're discussing this in a course on the presidency. Okay, so in midterm elections, all 435 seats in the United States House of Representatives are up for election, since members of the House serve only two-year terms. Additionally, one-third of the Senate is up. With Senate terms set at six years apiece, Senate elections are staggered, with one-third of its seats up every two years. Finally, there tends to be a lot at stake at the state level as well with 37 of the 50 governorships up for election and about three quarters of the roughly 7,500 state legislative seats across the US up for election. So these elections are a big deal as they can determine which party controls each chamber of Congress, as well as the partisan balance across each of the state governments throughout the United States. And there is one very strong overriding historical trend in midterm elections. That trend is that the president's party tends to lose seats in midterm elections, sometimes catastrophically so. Looking at the history of midterms going all the way back to the Civil War, the president's party has lost seats in the House of Representatives 37 out of 40 times. That is a remarkable trend approaching something close to a law of American politics that the president's party loses seats in the House. And usually we're talking about substantial losses, averaging a loss of 31 seats for the president's party since the House was first apportioned at its current size of 435 seats following the 1910 census. Each of our last four presidents has seen his party lose the majority in the House of Representatives during a midterm election. President Trump in 2018, when Democrats gained control of the House with a 40 seat gain. President Obama in 2010, when Republicans won the majority with a 63 seat landslide. 2006 under President Bush, when Democrats picked up 30 seats. And 1994 under President Clinton, when Republicans gained 55 seats to give it a majority in the House for the first time in 40 years. The historical trend in the Senate is more mixed with the president's party losing seats in 24 out of the last 40 midterm elections and an average loss of four seats. Finally, the president's party also tends to suffer in state legislatures with an average loss of 365 state legislative seats across the country for the president's party. Interestingly, gubernatorial elections are not nearly as prone to these trends as congressional elections and state legislative elections are. Elections for governor tend to take on a character of their own that can overcome partisan trends. And we can see that even in today's highly polarized times with Democrats recently winning gubernatorial elections in deep red states like Kentucky, Louisiana, and Kansas, and Republicans winning in deep blue states like Massachusetts, Maryland, and Vermont. So what's going on here? Why does the president's party tend to do so badly in midterm elections, particularly in the House of Representatives? There are a variety of factors at play. First is what's called the surge and decline theory. This theory holds that in presidential election years, the president tends to have what are referred to as coattails, helping to carry members of his party to victory in House races across the country, while also winning the White House at the same time. Presidential elections tend to drive voter turnout, and many voters who cast ballots because of the presidential race go ahead and also punch their ballots for the president's 
party candidate in other races as well. Sometimes without a whole lot of regard to the individual candidates in those races further down the ballot. The idea here is that in presidential election years, some members of the president's party win seats they probably wouldn't have won on their own. So they're left exposed two years later in the midterm when they can't rely upon the president to help carry them across the finish line again. This theory did a pretty good job of explaining midterm election trends in the second half of the 20th century when landslide presidential elections were commonplace. But in our contemporary period, in which most presidential elections are decided by just a few percentage points, it's become less evident that presidents sweep many other party members into office with them. In fact, in 2020, as Joe Biden was winning the national popular vote by four and a half percent, Democrats actually lost seats in the House. No coattails for the Democrats in that instance. So there have to be other factors at work here as well. One of these is the presidential approval decay curve. By the time midterm elections come around, presidents' approval ratings have generally suffered a fair amount of decline. And it's generally the case that low presidential approval ratings tend to be correlated with losses for the president's party in the midterms. Also, candidate quality tends to look different in midterm election years. Members of Congress in the president's party oftentimes see the writing on the wall and choose to retire rather than engage in a difficult re-election fight when the national trends are not in their favor. Meanwhile, the out party, you know, the party opposite of the president's party, the out party smells blood in the water, if you will, and tends to recruit strong challengers who give the party its best chance of winning new seats. Additionally, the electorate that turns out to vote in midterm elections tends to look a bit different from the electorate that turns out in presidential election years. Roughly a third of US voters only vote in presidential elections. And that one third is not evenly distributed across the population. Instead, we tend to see differential turnout in midterm elections with an electorate that is older, more educated, and more likely affiliated with the opposing political party to that of the president. Political psychology has depressingly documented again and again that negative emotion is a better driver of voter turnout than positive emotion. One reason why you see so many attack ads in campaign season. And who's more likely to be filled with negative emo emotion when midterm elections roll around? People affiliated with the out party, the opposition to the president's party. They've had to endure two years of the other team if you will, holding power. Meanwhile, it's easy for complacency to set in for the president's party. Voters of the president's party are less likely to be highly motivated to turn out to vote in midterm elections. Finally, there's a small but significant fraction of the electorate that tends to engage in what's called balancing in their voting behavior. These are voters who prefer to see divided government with Democrats in charge of one branch and Republicans in charge of the other as a way of trying to keep either party from implementing too radical of an agenda. Put this all together and you get the following story about why midterm elections are an uphill battle for the president's party. In midterms, there are some subpar members of Congress in the president's party who kind of lucked into their seats two years earlier and now their luck is about to run out combined with the fact that the savvier members of the president's party can see the writing on the wall and decide to retire rather than suffer the humiliation of being voted out of office, leaving an open seat that's easier for the opposing party to pick up. Meanwhile, the opposing party is fired up at the chance to regain power and scours the country to find high quality candidates to run for Congress. Meanwhile, amongst the electorate, Voters in the out party are similarly fired up at the chance to voice their displeasure with the president's performance, while complacent and perhaps disillusioned members of the president's party have kind of tuned out of politics for a while, knowing that their team is running the show. While a handful of moderate independent voters look to place the president's opponents in charge of Congress to keep anything too radical from happening. That's a somewhat simplified crystallization of what happens in midterm elections, 
but it's a pretty good explanation of why we see such a striking historical trend. Since I've made kind of a big deal about how strong the historical trend has been against the president's party in midterm elections, it's worth taking a look at the handful of times the historical trend did not hold. What was going on those three times out of 40 in which the president's party actually picked up seats in the House? The first instance was in 1934. This was the first midterm of FDR's presidency, and the Democrats picked up nine seats in the House and 10 seats in the Senate, further cementing their majority status in each chamber. The pretty straightforward analysis is that the New Deal agenda of the Roosevelt administration was quite popular. And even though the United States remained in the Great Depression, the public gave Roosevelt and the Democrats credit for taking aggressive action to deal with this generational challenge. It's not for nothing that FDR is generally rated as one of the top three presidents in US history. He managed to keep the public with him through some unbelievably difficult times. The second case of midterm elections that bucked the trend came in 1998, when Bill Clinton's Democrats picked up four seats in the House and held steady in the Senate. In this case, there are two main things that saved the president's bacon. First, the economy was in very good shape at the time, with high levels of employment, wage growth, and a booming stock market during the height of the 1990s dot-com boom. But that alone is not a great explanation. There have been plenty of other times where a favorable economy has not saved the president's party during midterm elections. The bigger story with this election was the fact that it occurred as House Republicans were moving forward with articles of impeachment against the president for his behavior relating to his illicit relationship with Monica Lewinsky. A strong majority of the public was opposed to impeaching the president for what they saw as failings in his personal life that were not directly connected to the performance of his job. In pursuing impeachment, the Republicans made the midterm elections about themselves rather than about the president and his party, and they suffered the consequences for it. It was such a striking blow that the Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, who had led the impeachment charge, resigned shortly after the election. And the last exception to the rule occurred in 2002, when George W. Bush was still experiencing a rally round the flag effect in the wake of the September 11th attacks, and with the nation at war in Afghanistan and mobilizing for war in Iraq. This is long before public opinion turned decidedly against Bush's foreign policy response to the terrorist attacks. These three cases demonstrate that in political science, there are no ironclad scientific laws. We've done a good job of recognizing certain trends and developing pretty good explanations for the strength of those historical trends, but politics is messy and it's never certain that what held true in the past will also hold true in the future. Since I'm posting this lecture video mere weeks before the 2022 midterm elections, let's take a look at what we learned and see how it can inform the way we look at the upcoming election. The partisan balance in Congress is highly contested, with the Democrats holding the tiniest of edges in the Senate with a 50-50 split and Vice President Harris casting the tie-breaking vote for Democrats, and the Democrats clinging to a five-seat majority in the House of Representatives. The historical trends that we've talked about in this video would indicate that Republicans are very likely to gain control of both chambers of Congress following November's elections. But will this election buck that trend? Let's examine more closely some of the historical factors and analyze them in the context of this election. This isn't so much about making a prediction, but rather analyzing the extent to which those historical factors are at play in the times that we're currently in. I would say that two of the historical explanations for midterm election results are definitely working in Republicans' favor. The first is President Biden's relatively low public approval ratings, which have followed the typical decay curve discussed earlier. At the time I'm recording this, President Biden's approval rating is in the low 40%, between 40 to 42%, depending upon the pollster. That's a level of support that would generally predict a pretty good showing for Republicans in the upcoming election. Additionally, 
public opinion survey data has for months indicated that Republican voters are highly motivated to vote in the midterms. That would be consistent with the differential turnout that has led to success for the out party in previous midterms. On the other hand, though, there are a few important factors that seem to be working against the historical trend and working in the Democrats' favor. Candidate quality usually works in the out party's favor in midterm elections, but this time around that appears not to be the case. Republicans have nominated a large number of, to put it kindly, eccentric candidates this year. In the wake of Trump's big election lie and the January 6th insurrection, the former president aggressively asserted himself into the nominating process and helped a number of election deniers and candidates with extreme views and skimpy records of public service to gain nomination on the Republican side, particularly in key Senate races. Meanwhile, we've not seen the usual wave of retirements that historical trends would have predicted on the Democratic side, again, particularly in the Senate. Also surprisingly working in the Democrats' favor is that Democratic voters are also highly motivated, particularly in the wake of the Supreme Court's Dobbs decision, which struck down abortion rights protected for half a century by Roe versus Wade. Rather than one side being highly mobilized and the other side being complacent, which has been the historical trend for midterms, it appears that this year there may be very high turnout on both sides. Finally, as I mentioned earlier in the video, the 2020 election was weird in that as Joe Biden was comfortably winning the popular, the national popular vote in the presidential race, Democrats in the House had a pretty rough election, actually losing 13 seats. In other words, there are not really any Democrats in the House who were swept to victory in 2020 by Joe Biden and who are now kind of in over their heads. So there's not a lot of low-lying fruit for the Republicans to, to pick off in the House of Representatives. So all in all, it's going to be fascinating to see how these factors will actually play out. While Democrats are probably likely to do better than the historical average of a 30-seat loss in the House, they'd have to do way better than that and limit their losses to four seats or less to hold on to their majority in the House. That seems like a pretty tall order even with some unusual factors working in their favor in this election cycle. But on the Senate side, it would not be surprising to see the Democrats hold their own or even pick up a seat or two. Okay, that's as close as I'm coming to a prediction. What do you all think? What else is going on in the election that I've left out of the analysis? What do you think is going to happen in November? If you're following the midterm campaigns, I encourage you to post your thoughts and analysis to the class discussion board.